Some people are fascinated with space and astronomy from early childhood. I was not one of those people. I wasn't memorizing constellations or stargazing on summer nights trying to catch a glimpse of the Milky Way galaxy. I was one of those kids who was far more enamored by the galaxy far, far away in the Star Wars films rather than the one that we can supposedly view in real life through telescopes or the naked eye on a clear moonless night. In fact, I'm not sure I ever recall seeing the Milky Way with my own two eyes in my entire life. But now, ever since becoming gripped by this massive topic of ancient cosmology, I've been consuming just so much footage of the sky, the stars, and photos supposedly sent from space. Without a doubt, I've now looked at more images of the heavens just over the last year than all the years of my life before that combined. And more recently, all these star time lapses and space footage, both allegedly real and openly computer generated, has got me thinking about the Milky Way galaxy in a way that I can't believe I never thought of before. I'm sure other people out there have already touched on this, but I, I actually can't find anything, at least on YouTube, that specifically highlighted it. And uh, in my opinion, this point about the Milky Way galaxy should probably be right up there alongside the matter of the photoshopped images of the Earth from space, and the whole debate over the visibility of the stars from space, both of which most of us are probably already quite familiar with. The black void. Yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, because yeah, you time. can see yeah, because yeah. you can see the stars. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, and, and uh, pretty much all the time you can see yeah. the stars. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon. The sky is uh, a deep black uh, when viewed from the moon, as it is when viewed from uh, cislunar space, the space between the Earth and the moon. The issue of the conflicting astronaut testimonies is damning enough already, but when we add to this the additional matter of the Milky Way galaxy, to me it just becomes almost ridiculous. I mean, the Milky Way is hands down one of the most breathtaking subjects of astrophotography. It's captivated the minds and imaginations of human beings throughout all of recorded history, and is found within the mythologies of virtually every ancient civilization on Earth. Before the industrial age and the atmospheric light pollution that accompanied it, there wasn't a single child living who, unlike myself, could claim that they'd never seen the Milky Way firsthand. It's inspired awe since the beginning, and it's just as breathtaking to behold today. But this is precisely what is just so absolutely confounding when we turn and consider the vast catalog of images that are supposedly taken from space. If you do a Google search for something like Milky Way from Space, you will basically get one of two things. Either you will see an artist's renderings of the galaxy as a whole, which look like this, or you will see images said to be taken from the International Space Station, which of course shows the Milky Way peeking over the horizon of the ball Earth. And that's pretty much it. We don't see a hint of that dazzling band of white and pink from any of the photos from the Apollo missions. We don't see it in any Earth orbit spacewalk pictures. We don't see even a suggestion of it in any of the photographs taken from the host of different probes that have been sent out to the different planets in our solar system. And you really just have to stop for a second and consider the significance of this. When we remember just how drawn to this celestial sight we are whenever we see it from Earth. Because this is the whole point. If the Milky Way can look so spectacular from Earth on a clear moonless night, even when viewed through the Earth's atmosphere, then how much more brilliant should it be from the vacuum of space where there is no atmospheric interference? You're going to tell me that after all these decades, in all the history of space travel, the Milky Way galaxy has never been photographed, even unintentionally, during a single spacewalk, or from the moon, or from any of the probes that have gone out into different directions of the solar system? <laughs> the Voyager 1 probe could supposedly capture a picture of the quote little blue dot Earth suspended in a sunbeam, 
but it somehow could never manage to capture anything resembling the galaxy that supposedly engulfs the entire solar system itself. I mean, can you imagine being one of those few lucky humans to go into space? And you're all suited up in your spacesuit, and floating out there, surrounded by this vastness, trying to comprehend the magnitude of the distances in every direction. And the stripe of the Milky Way galaxy, which is no longer obscured by the atmosphere or the horizon of Earth, surrounded you in a 360 degree circle. If you could get your spacesuit to spin around in a full rotation, you could see the whole thing unbroken. I mean, you could take regular photographic images of it. I mean, it's in the visible light spectrum, after all. We can see it from Earth with our own eyeballs. Of course, I would be remiss at this stage if I did not mention the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is claimed to have done this very thing, capturing thousands of individual images taken with an infrared camera as it spun a full 360 degrees in space. And those are then supposedly spliced together to make this big complete picture. <laughs> Interestingly enough, the Spitzer Space Telescope is named after Lyman Spitzer, who was a very central figure in the development of modern astronomy. His research focused on the interstellar medium, specifically plasma physics, and he was the leading original proponent of the idea of a space telescope, spearheading the project that would eventually produce the Hubble Space Telescope. He was a faculty member first at Yale and then Princeton, and then in 1984 he was one of the founding members of the globalist organization known as the World Cultural Council, which every year hands out the Albert Einstein World Award of Science. Oh, and did I mention he was also, interestingly enough, a member of the Order of Skull and Bones, class of 1935. So, very interesting indeed. Definitely gonna have to come back and take a closer look at him sometime. Anyhow, back to the Milky Way. What's kind of ironic about the fact that we never see the Milky Way photobombing NASA pictures of anything else in the solar system is that when we look at so many of the, quote, artist renderings or openly CGI depictions of things like satellites and probes and stuff, much of the time the artists will go ahead and put the Milky Way in the background, presumably because they, of course, think that it looks much more visually engaging than just a black background. And, of course, the assumption is that it would be quite visible. Or if we were to get a bit more conspiratorial about it, we might ask if this is just another example of how NASA uses the illusionist's method of misdirection, where they, they're constantly jumping back and forth between supposedly real footage and then artists' conceptions, to the point where the average person doesn't scrutinize what has or has not been shown to exist in the quote, real footage. Our brains just kind of fill in the blanks, you know, assuming that we've seen the Milky Way in real space footage countless times. Just like we all assumed we've seen countless photos of the globe, until we actually stopped and tested that assumption. This picture I thought was uh, particularly interesting, kind of funny, because it was, uh, was created by an artist as a conceptual representation for a project uh, supposedly in the works by this International Lunar Observatory Association, which is uh, proposing to try and put a radio telescope on the south pole of the moon so that it would be able to get a better shot of the Milky Way galaxy. So of course they, they show it here in the photograph, even though it's a radio telescope, it's not... It, isn't it funny how all these telescopes that they're putting into space uh, are, you know, radio telescopes, infrared telescopes, they're not... <laughs> they're not... They're not bothering to put anything that just takes normal photographs in the visible light spectrum because with all the... If you ever open up that can of worms and start sh actually showing photos with it, it's a glaring continuity problem. But there, but here you go, in this one he put it in. Another aspect of the Milky Way that I think is very interesting is that it really is the, the foundational piece upon which all the modern astronomical theories regarding things like nebulas and star formation uh, seem to be extrapolated from. Remember that prior to the Hubble and all these amazing photos that it supposedly provided us with, the Milky Way was pretty much the only thing in the sky that had this flowy, milky, cloudy appearance, which we are told is massive amounts of cosmic gas and dust. Personally, I think the Milky Way was the inspiration for both the pseudoscientific theories regarding nebulas and how cosmic gases create stars and everything, and the artistic depictions of all those awe-inspiring nebulas. I basically suspect that they just started airbrushing different nebula shapes and colors that were all modeled after this style originally found in the Milky Way. 
And speaking of cosmic gases and nebulas, that again is another perfect example of how modern astronomy is absolutely inseparable from the theories of cosmic evolution. Nebulas house baby stars in every spiral arm of the galaxy. These regions are the nurseries for new stars. There are young stars in these regions that are heating up gas clouds that surround them and making those gas clouds glow pink. Stars are made out of gas, basically, and our galaxy has gas. In fact, our galaxy, you can think of it as having an atmosphere of gas and dust that surrounds all of the stars that we see in the disk. And it's from this gas that new stars are born. By observing nebulas at different stages in their evolution, the story of a star's birth begins to emerge. It all starts inside a cold, dark cloud of dust and hydrogen gas, where a quiet tug of war begins. The cloud wants to dissipate, like smoke in the air, but gravity wants to pull it together. They're in a kind of balance between gravity pulling in and gas pressure pushing back out. Gravity wins, and the material crunches down into a disk that is the beginning of becoming a star. As gravity pulls more and more gas towards the center of the disk, it gets denser and denser and hotter and hotter. Until finally, at 18 million degrees, a miraculous transformation takes place. Hydrogen atoms fuse together to form helium, and with a burst of nuclear energy, a star begins to shine. These stars eventually get their nuclear fires going in the core, and when they do, they heat up, they uh, can expel the material that's around them so that it kind of clears up the neighborhood. Over the next few million years, winds blow the surrounding gas into spectacular swirling patterns. It blows away the gas, it blows away the dust, and it lets us see this beautiful new thing, this place where the star has been born. So, you know, once again, we see that the explanations coming from NASA and all the other space agencies are absolutely predicated upon the assumptions of massive expanses of both time and space, and the assumption that gravity must also exist to pull these cosmic gases together over millions of years, crushing it together until it becomes so dense that nuclear fusion occurs and the star ignites. <laughs> I highly encourage anyone interested to go watch the full documentary on the Milky Way for themselves. I'll have the link in the description and just go see for yourself if they show any real photographic images of the Milky Way from space. Or if it's just computer rendered animations. And then as you watch that, you tell me how interwoven everything they say about nebulas and the formation of stars is absolutely, absolutely inseparable from it, cosmic evolution. Because, I mean, at this point, we really should be able to just step back and see how it all fits together uh, through the perspective of the evolutionary agenda, in that all these components are absolutely required in order to even attempt to teach the Big Bang as a plausible scientific theory. You need a vast universe, Copernicanism, full of particles, atomism, which gradually pull themselves together, gravity, until erupting in a nuclear explosion to create stars in nuclear physics, quantum physics. And when you really simplify it down like that, it's pretty astounding. Without Copernicanism, atomic theory, gravity, and nuclear physics, there is no Big Bang Theory. Simple as that.